Hi, and welcome to what will be a short video on the basics of EKG. To start off, you need to know that a uh, depolarization wave, if it's propagating toward an electrode, you get a positive deflection. Away from an electrode, you get a negative deflection. If it's perpendicular to that electrode, you get an isoelectric or biphasic deflection. And for repolarization wave propagation, the conventions are opposite. This will be um, pertinent when thinking about the T wave in particular, but definitely the top half is what's most important and what you absolutely need to know. Moving forward, so we have three physical leads that, that are placed on a patient and somehow we get six leads from that in the EKG reading. You get a left lead, uh, limb lead, you get a right one and you have one on the foot, not really the foot, but in the direction of the foot. And what we do is we combine, or a machine combines the left and right limb leads to get a new limb lead that we will call one. And then the right and foot limb leads, we combine those, get two. And then left and foot, we combine those and get three. The directions of these arrows are uh, important. However, this view, even though this is what it looks like as represented like from a gross anatomy perspective, is not all that useful when it comes to thinking about this as it relates to the EKG. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the origins of each of these arrows and put them at the origin of a uh, graph. And that's what's done here. So you can see all of those. Um, you can reference the right hand corner, upper right hand corner to see that we've taken the origins of these arrows and shifted them so that they're at the origin of what is now a graph. You can see that the left limb lead um, is at negative 30 degrees. The, uh, and so on, but notice that that is negative. So the sign conventions are opposite of what we're used to. Um, quadrant one is negative and, and so forth. Notice that the right limb lead, we can call that negative 150 or positive 210, doesn't matter. And then the dotted red arrow, this is our, I'm gonna call the ideal um, direction of propagation for the depolarization wave. But note that the normal axis for the heart can lie anywhere between negative 30 degrees and 90 degrees. So it can really uh, vary quite a bit from person to person. And this, this is particularly important when interpreting the um, EKG. So if we look at the direction of propagation and combine that with what we had said before, if the depolarization wave is moving toward the electrode, it'd be positive, wave from electrode negative, and if it's perpendicular, it's isoelectric. So if we keep that in mind, you should predict then that leads one and two should be positive. And if we look at the EKG reading, we can see that leads one and two are positive. I just wanna add that we should actually expect the amplitude of lead one to be um, larger than the amplitude of lead two because it's, it's moving more so in the direction of limb lead one. And then for limb leads uh, left and foot, we should also predict those to be positive, which they are in this representation. For the right limb lead, we should predict a negative deflection. And then for limb lead three, you can, hopefully you can tell that it's approximately uh, 45 degrees or perpendicular. So we predict that that would be isoelectric, which is what we see on the right there. Again, this is for what I'm calling an idealistic uh, direction of propagation. And just keep in mind the normal axis is quite a large range of degrees. So when you actually do an EKG, you're, you're very unlikely to get exactly this representation. Okay, so those were the three physical limb leads that we kind of made into six limb leads, but there are also six chest leads, and those just go on the um, anterior chest wall. We have V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and um, those aren't so important right now uh, for, for starting out, so don't worry too much about those. So what's gonna happen from this point forward is we're going to have a lot of kind of pictures like this where the leads are grouped together. So one, two, three, right, left, foot, and then V one through six. They're gonna be grouped together by associations. For example, the purple or magenta color here, uh, these are the inferior leads. And so you could be shown this and be told these are your inferior leads and I want to caution you from doing this because I don't think that this is particularly helpful when it comes to thinking about EKG or interpreting them. Um, you may be very tempted to memorize this way like memorize shapes and colors and all that but um, I warn you because there's more coming. For example we can say oh there may be an ST elevation in leads two and three 
or V1, V2, and that could mean something. And then, then you'll try to memorize that, that kind of shape or configuration on the EKG reading as well. And then we keep adding more and more to the story and suddenly it all blends together. Um, I caution you, but I also wanna replace that with a different um, kind of paradigm here. And that's this. So instead of looking at it this way and grouping it together this way, I think it should be grouped together this way, and that is the, the, the graph way. So if you look at limb leads, I'm on the top left of this where the actual graph is. If you look at limb leads one and left, you can see that those are on the lateral side. So those are in fact lateral leads. If you look at the bottom of the graph, reading from left to right, you'd see three foot and two. Those are your inferior leads. And you can see that that corresponds to this over here. So I think this is a better way to do it. Um, because the other way doesn't give you a three-dimensional um, reference point, and this does, which uh, is useful later on uh, down the road. Notice that for the lateral leads, we said left and one, but we also have V5 and V6 from the chest leads, and then we also have septal leads, V1, V2, and then anterior leads, V3, V4. Now, these are important because if um, there happens to be, let's say, like ischemia or myocardial infarction, you could translate that to, by reading the EKG, you could translate that to which coronary artery is likely affected. I want to point out that um, LCX is left circumflex. So this is why this is important. Now these associations with the coronary arteries are not absolute and they will be, they'll vary from person to person and depending on if there's an axis deviation in that patient or not. But this is uh, really why I strongly support you making associations to this type of reference rather than to this type of reference. Because again, we add to the story and it'll be, I, I think it's trickier and trickier, even though this is tempting at first. Okay, so what about reading the actual EKG? So I want to walk you through um, kind of what um, I would do instead of what others might do. So the here we can see rate, rhythm, QRS complex, P wave. And again, this is just a basic approach, uh, certainly not comprehensive. So for rate, you can see if estimation's okay, what you can do is you can say 300, just the number 300 divided by the number of big boxes. So if you have one large box, um, you would say that that's a rate of 300 beats per minute. If you have two large boxes, so you divide that by two, you get 150 and so on. Um, I think it's worth memorizing at least the first five of these so that you can quickly estimate um, um, a heart rate. So for example, if you had, if you were just to glance at an EKG and you saw that they were three and a half big boxes, you would know that's about, let's say 85 beats per minute. Okay, if you're tachycardic, again, this is if estimation's okay, but if you're tachycardic, you would say 1500 divided by the number of small boxes. And of course, this is going to be a more precise representation of your of your heart rate and you would want to use this if it's faster because you wouldn't want to estimate um, I, I would commit these to memory and I would probably know that just to speed things up now if the rates are regular um, then you would do the number of R's so from the QRS complex the number of R's within 30 big boxes and then you would multiply that by 10 um, but again you should do that sparingly because it takes a long time to count that and then for rhythm this is really all that there is for rate in the EKG for rhythm, um, if the Qs, again, that's Q from QRS complex, if they're equidistant from each other, we'd call that regular, and that's always equidistant from each other. If it's not, then we'd say that's irregular. If it's irregular, we have two categories. Um, if, it's, um, if there's a pattern to it, so if it's regular and then that irregularity repeats itself somewhere on the EKG, we would call that regularly irregular, and if there's no pattern, we'd say irregularly irregular. Now, the QRS complex, we can look at that now. If it's less than 0 0.12 seconds, which we'll find out soon is less than three small boxes, um, we would call that a narrow complex, and this is normal. And then if it's not, so if it's larger than this, we would call that a broad complex um, wave. All right, so this is rate, rhythm, QRS complex. Rate, rhythm, I want to point out when, when you're presenting a patient, you would say the patient had regular rate and rhythm. This is what we're referring to. Um, Okay, so the P wave, if the P wave is uh, present, we'll do this first. Uh, actually, timeout. This is just general characteristics. None of this on, on the left here 
is meant to give you a diagnosis. It's just to give you general um, features about the EKG. On the right side, the reason why I put this on the right is because this can actually lead you to you know, an actual diagnosis of what's going on. So if the P wave is present, then uh, you can ask yourself, is it a sawtooth? Because that's very distinguishable. So if it's sawtooth, we call that atrial flutter. These often have predictable rates, uh, 150, 175. Notice that that's uh, divisions of 300. So atrial flutter looks like this. Any EKG picture that you see on, on this web that I have going on, this is directly from USMLE RX First Aid. And then, um, so again, that's if sawtooth. You can see the little saw, saw teeth is very distinguishable. If it's present and if the PR interval is prolonged, and here's reference for you, then it's probably an atrioventricular heart block. There are many types of those, so you still have more questions to ask. If it's without a dropped QRS complex, so they're not dropped from the graph, you can still see them, then this is a first degree heart block. These are usually asymptomatic, and um, this is what that looks like. And then if it's, um, if their QRS complex is dropped, you have another question. If the P waves and the QRS complexes completely uh, are completely dissociated or independent of one another, then that's gonna be a third or third degree or complete heart block. And that would look like this. And you can see that this right here, here's, these are the, the P waves. You can see that it's, it's just doing its thing at a regular interval, but it's um, completely independent of QRS. So that means that the atrium, the ventric, uh, ventricles are dissociated. And so we call this a complete heart block or third degree heart block. So I put here often with predictable rate of 40 to 60 or 30 to 40 beats per minute. We'll come back to that um, later uh, because that, that can help you uh, diagnose pretty quickly. In fact, you may not even need an EKG to diagnose that. Um, okay, so if they're not independent, so they, they, they're dependent on one another, there is some pattern between the two, the atrium, the ventricles, that would be some form of second degree heart block. Um, and then if the PR interval is progressively prolonged, we would call that type one, Mobitz type one. And you can see that the PR interval gets longer and longer and longer, and then we drop a beat. So we're still dropping a beat, but it's with a pro prolonged, progressively prolonged uh, PR interval. If it's not progressive, it's type two. All right, so then let's move back up here. This is if the P wave is uh, present. If it's absent though, there's still some stuff that we can think about. So if QRS complex, complexes are still present, so again, P wave's not there, but you still have QRS, then that's probably going to be atrial fibrillation, and that's gonna look like that. And if there are no discernible waves, that's probably uh, V-fib, and that's gonna look like that. Okay, so this is the um, overall of what's going on, and I will include a, a PDF of that, so you don't have to um, screenshot this video or anything. Okay, so that's about reading the EKG. Again, that's just the basic. I wanna point out though, there are other things that still still to come. So that's why it's important that the foundation is very strong so that then you can use that foundation to further differentiate with these types of things, which I'm, I'm not gonna talk about, just, just to make the point that there's more coming and it, it um, makes the story even more complex. Okay, so here's some things that you just need to know. Um, the pacemaker rates, you need to know the relative rates, but also it's a good idea to know the absolute rates um, SA node is approximately 60, 80, AV node is approximately 40, 60, anything downstream of that. So the bundle of his, the Purkinje fibers, or the uh, myocytes and the ventricles, that's usually between 20 and 40 beats per minute. Now look at the AV node rate, pacemaker rate, and then the downstream, I just call it downstream because there's multiple things that it could be there. Notice it's 40 to 60 or 20 to 40, and I want to go back and remind you that I said that for third degree heart block, it had a predictable rate. And... Um, that's because you're blocking the SA node. And so it, it can have a predictable rate in that sense. The EKG standard, so small boxes are 0 0.04 seconds, big box is 0 0.2. Normal va values, PR interval, QRS complex, QT interval, that's very, it's heart, a variable heart rate dependent. And then for the heart rates, just know that um, above 100 is tachycardic, below 60 is bradycardic, and anything in between that is normocardic. For first aid, the 2018 version, you absolutely need to know just cold, page 288 or 2019, page 291, but you need to look online for the errata because that page has significant errors that you need to correct in your edition or exam questions will be wrong. Okay, so now for some practice, I have a link there for you if you wanna do the rest of this quiz, but it, um, it's asking us to determine the QRS axis for this EKG. So um, the first thing I would do is ask, 
which leads are positive. Notice that I've left off the one, two, three, four, five, six, because again, this is just basic right now. We need to, I guess, deal with half the picture first. So I would ask myself what's positive first, and it looks like you can see leads uh, three and uh, foot are positive. Everything else I would say is not positive. Um, and so what we would predict then is that we're toward this direction. The, so this is normal, but that's not what this patient actually is. We're more toward this way, so those are the only ones that are positive. Then I would ask myself, what's a negative? We can see that one is negative and also left is negative. And that's it. So we should predict that we are moving away from or greater than 45 degrees from limb leads one and left. So it looks like we're going this way. And that is confirmed by the fact that these leads are negative, which is away, right? This direction would be away from limb leads one and left. And then I would ask myself, what's isoelectric? So the isoelectric ones, it looks like is it's two and right, it's approximately isoelectric in this one. And then so we should uh, suspect that we are roughly perpendicular to limb leads two and right. So here's two, here's right, and to be perpendicular to both would require somewhere around in here. Now I say approximately perpendicular, right, because it's gonna depend on where the person put the uh, leads and, and these probably aren't exactly isoelectric and so forth. So if we look in this direction, it looks like we're going this way, which is confirmed by everything else we said. So then it looks like the answer would be a positive 150 degrees. So the answer is E here. Okay, for the second question, it says determine the axis for this EKG. Again, I would ask myself what's positive. It looks like leads one, two, and foot are uh, all positive. So we should predict that we're somewhere in this direction. Then I would say what's negative. It looks like uh, only the right lead is negative, so we should be moving away from the right lead, which is, again, somewhere in this direction would be away from the right lead. And then I would ask myself, what's isoelectric? It looks like only lead uh, three is isoelectric. So we should be about perpendicular to this in this direction. So it looks like the red arrow is actually the answer here, which is, again, positive 30 degrees. So the answer is C. Okay, for the next question, it says, what is the PR interval in this EKG? So P to R, so it'd be about right here is P, the P wave and the QRS. So P and then R is here. So if this is a big box, that's five smalls plus two smalls, so seven smalls. Small boxes are worth 0 0.04, so seven times that gives us D, 0 0.28 seconds. And then one more question. What is the QRS duration seen here? And then so we get started Q, so here's Q. Um, I don't see, I was hoping one of these would start on a line, but they don't. But Q is here, it's a little bit off the line, and then QRS would be about here. And um, so that's less than two smalls, I'm gonna say one and a half. Actually, for calculation, let's just say it's two, but we know the answer will be less than that. So 0 0.04 times two is 0 0.08, and a little bit less than that is B. So the answer is 0 0.06 seconds. Okay, um, I wanna caution you though, um, the arrhythmias are taught just before the exam, so what they are, how to interpret them, and then how to treat them, it's just before. So if you don't practice now, um, these skills aren't really going to be there, and then they're, you're going to be hit with a lot of information at one, once, and it's going to be very difficult to um, deal with that. Okay, I hope you found this helpful, and good luck.